Love this edition of Leadership Lessons from Mayberry. Jacob Maloshek, classic entrepreneur. His first step into business ownership, complete failure. Wiped him out. But with incredible perseverance and the ability to learn, he now has a thriving business called Arc Financial. You will find this enjoyable, enlightening. You're going to learn a lot. And I cannot wait to bring this episode of Jacob Maloshek from Arc Financial to Leadership Lessons from Mayberry. Jacob, this is the first time I've had a guest on the show that wanted to look just like me. You wore the same shirt, the glasses, the haircut. Right. We're twinning today. I love it. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've been so flattered. But anyway, (laughs) listen, we're talking to Jacob Loshik, of course, of Art Financial. And I love your story because uh, there's so much to learn from the perseverance and and overcoming some early challenges in your career. But before we get to all of that, we always start with what's your Mayberry. And, you know, your Mayberry is Wahoo, Nebraska. Yeah. So I want to hear what was it like growing up in Wahoo? You know, growing up in Wahoo, Nebraska, you know, I was I was coming up when Wahoo was known for sports, and I really wasn't the sports guy. So, you know, kind of sitting on the outside of that, and, uh, you know, I just kind of found my passion early in, in working and found some success and some validation in that. And so tried to be as good of a student as I could be while, while working and kind of, you know, kind of just finding out who I was in in wahoo so it was it was a great experience what kind of jobs and when did you start so i it was kind of a weird thing you know so times are different today than than they are now right so there's probably a little bit more oversight i started when i was 14 working at a restaurant um i was just doing you know i started as a dishwasher in that restaurant um i got promoted to the bus boy right and uh, that was probably, you know, I know that you want to talk about leadership lessons. That was probably the first leadership lesson I ever learned, Tim, is that if you want to get promoted, you have to train somebody to do the job you're doing. So I got my best friend at the time, Josh, to take the dishwasher job. And then I, I got promoted to bus boy, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I was part of the tip pool. I don't know so, if that was training or manipulating. It sounds like one or the other, but I love it. Yeah. It was a good thought. So I started working there and then... Um, started working at the grocery store. So, uh, another one of my buddies, uh, got let go at the grocery store. I, I, you know, when you're 15, 16, whatever you do. And, uh, so I, I walked in the grocery store and I, and talking to the manager and I was like, Hey, guy had his job. And uh, they're like, absolutely. So, you know, the, the first part of my career, my first life was, it was in the grocery business and it kind of started there. Um, that being said, growing up in Wahoo, I would say that from a business perspective, Tim, like I had a really, really negative view on business. Um, just because, you know, in my family, my mom had a, had a little, ca- not where I worked, but she had a little cafe and it struggled. And, you know, the grocery store I worked for really wasn't thriving in, 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 in small town America as, you know, Walmart's coming online and all this stuff. And so, you know, my, my perspective of business is that, man, this is just a struggle. So I need to go find something else to do in my life. Right. And so that's kind of how, that's kind of how that started, but just got some great experience that, you know, I'm so lucky that I grew up in the time that I did just because some of those opportunities aren't necessarily available to, to youth today. Right. So I got to run, you know, when I was 16 years old, I got to run the store on Sunday by myself. Right. So that was just crazy that that happened. And, uh, you go through a lot of, you, you learn a lot from your mistakes. And so unfortunately there's probably a trail of people, um, you know, throughout my career that have paid for my education unknowingly, right? Yeah, so. right, exactly. <laughs> well, here's what here's what I find fascinating, though, about it. I mean, you said, look, I didn't see a lot of huge successes, right? The grocery store, small town grocery store, not not killing it. Your mother's uh, cafe was was you know functioning, but not necessarily you know thriving. Yeah. So why did you? How did that inspire you to want to be an entrepreneur? So what had happened is in high school, it was just kind of a funny deal. Uh, I wanted to get out of school for a day and the FBLA was competing at a, at a state competition. And so I was taking an accounting class and uh, 
I remember Mr. Jarzinka, we go and we sign up. And this is the first time Wahoo, as I remember it, competed in this competition. And so we all signed up for the for the thing that we wanted to do. And it was just mostly kind of hanging out with the girls and going, you know, going to go, <laughs> going to the competition, man. right? And uh, we show up and they said, hey, you know what? You have to sign up for three, you know, three different events. And we were all like, oh, we only signed up for one. So last minute we picked these different events and... Um, just so happens one of the events I picked was in finance and I'd never taken a finance course or anything along those lines. And it was just one of those weird experiences. I went, sat down and took the test and it made sense to me. And out of the whole group, I was the first one done. So that's either a really good thing or a really bad thing, Tim. And um, later that evening award ceremony, what do you know? I got first place in state and finance. And so it was just kind of one of those aha moments where it was like, wait a minute, maybe there is something that I'm good at that I didn't even realize. And so um, I think that was kind of one of those moments where it kind of changed my perspective on maybe what I was going to do. Cause I know from there, I, I, I thought that I was going to do something in life. And then it was, you know what, I'm going to go to the university and go into the CBA and and study business and so that's kind of that was one of those tipping points in wahoo that that just by happenstance i I, you kind of discover wait i may have some aptitude for this yeah so that was great i love fboa i think it's such an incredible organization but did it did it incentivize you to be more of an accountant or did it trigger you towards look i'm good at this and so that's kind of a natural you know, a, a natural bridge in the business. Yeah. So I didn't, or, or at that point, are you even thinking? Like, I'm not even, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not that, yeah, no. So I'm, I'm in high school at the time. Right. So last thing on my mind, <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. you know, all, all of that stuff, but, um, it, it did, it did let me kind of, it gave me some confidence. Right. And so you, we always say that, um, people need wins. And, you know, when they get a win, like they get that spark, they get that confidence. And for me, that, that was, that was it for me. It's like, I can do something and I can do it well. Now, whether they graded the test wrong, I don't know. <laughs> right? but, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but it, it, it worked for me. And I was good. So you've proven yourself over yeah. all these years. But, you know, what I love about that story as well is it just reminds me of your, your classic small town, right? Yeah. You had Mr. Jarzinka, yep. is that his name, yep. right? Played a huge role in your life by just being late and and had to get you in these other classes, but he believed in you and he put him yep. in. Uh, you've got the the, the gentleman at uh, the grocery store says, you're gonna run the grocery store on Sunday. Gave you right. huge responsibilities, right? So, so funny story. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll kick a, a funny story in there. I remember like the first time I ran the grocery store on a Sunday, I was 15 years old. Did I have a license, right? And uh, it, it was by accident because the uh, the manager of the grocery store was going to go fishing. And he throws me the keys and says, hey, you're going to run the store today. And I said, what if somebody gets hurt? I can't even take him to the hospital. <laughs> Call the ambulance. It'll be fine, right? I'm going fishing. And so, you know, it was so informal. Now, did people get hurt often at this place or what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I Probably not. Probably not. But... You know, it, it, it was just a great experience to kind of, you know, have some room to explore and kind of, kind of, again, get that self-confidence and believe in yourself. So. Yeah. And how much does a small town, how much should Wahoo, you know, play in that, that ability? I mean, if you're in a big city in Lincoln, this probably isn't happening, right? In Omaha, happening. right. Right. So how fortunate when you look back, what was it like growing up in Wahoo from your perspective? Is it one of those things that you feel like it was... You know, one of those childhoods, you, you just say, wow, you know, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Or was it different than that? Oh, uh, maybe a little bit different than that. But, you know, no matter where you're at. And so there's always key people that just kind of like push you in different directions. And so, you know, I go back to high school and just surrounded by great, edu- some, some really, really great educators. And, you know, again, I don't know if parents would be calling the school if, if teacher said to students what my teacher said to me, right? Um, but just a different a different time in a different era. And, you know, I, I can remember my physics teacher, uh, just a hard, hard person, a, a perfectionist. And, you know, at the time, like, I just, like, resented that. And, it, you know, having him for several classes, science classes over the year, by the time I became a senior, it was, wow, this guy pushed me further than I could ever imagine being and so 
like those types of people in your life. And, and that's what, that's what that small town gave me is that I don't know. And I could be wrong, right? Because there's great educators everywhere, Tim. But I just don't know if I was lost in a crowd of a large school, if those type of interactions would have happened, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, I, I just remember, you know, uh, Doug Watts uh, pulled me aside and, and, you know, he just gave me a stern a stern one-on-one. -on -one. And it was like, I don't like you right now, but I'm listening to what you're saying, right? And those those kinds of things that 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 people put into your life at, at, at that critical stage is just so so incredibly important. And you know, I look at today same experiences for me. I mean, I had some teachers do things that today, you know, kids would probably run home and tell their parents. Their parents would get involved. But same as you, I felt like I had some incredibly important lessons. And most of the time, those teachers were fair. Yeah, there were some times where they probably went over the line. But most of the time, I feel like I had such great, fair lessons. So the value of that, it doesn't sound like you ran home and said, hey, I just got my backside to get involved, mom or dad, right? And they probably would have said, we're not, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what did you get out of that? So just, again, kind of going back into understanding yourself, right? So not knowing that you can do tough things, knowing that you're not going to be perfect. And just, again, that self-confidence, that self-belief, yeah. I think is, I can look back and see some educators that put that in there. All the while, you know, probably my senior year, I was working 40 hours a week at the grocery store. And so I'm developing these other skills in, in Wahoo, Nebraska, and being able to do things that, frankly, um, happened in a small town yeah and so kind of going back to that so so what was I, I you know what was it like you know in the summer times in wahoo when you're 12 13 14 years old did you fish could you walk around town by yourself were you what was it like was that was it idyllic was it not you well, know the summer times like in wahoo as a kid well the one thing that i i question is how we were not just completely dehydrated, right? Because <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, going back, going back, and we got up, you know, at the, at that age, we got up in the morning, we got on our bikes, and we sweated all day long, and then we came back for supper. And I don't remember drinking water, right? So, like, that's such a great point. How did we survive that? Yeah. No, it it was good, right? And so, you know, carefree, right? And um, essentially carefree in in those times, and. You know, we just got on our bikes all day long and just whatever kids were out and we, we, just, we just traversed Wahoo and, and kind of kind of tore it up. And, you know, I think that there is probably some things where maybe a little bit more oversight would have probably been good because, again, uh, I'm not trying to co contrast today to then or anything like that um, because we all grew up in our own times. But, um, you know, you hear so many people say, I'm just so glad social media wasn't around you know, because yeah, we do, right. do some stupid stuff, yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. And uh, we 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 learned from that, and uh, you know, we we raised a little heck, and we 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 did that. But it was you know, it was good. It was you can you can learn from that as yeah. well. So one thing you shared with me is that look, when you grew up, money wasn't in huge abundance. No. Um, in fact, there were times you know it was kind of lean. Sure. Tell me about that, and and how that helped shape you as well. Sure. So um, I grew up in a in in a separate household. So mom and dad divorced real early. Um, so I I can't say that I, I I can say that being in that situation though I had the most ideal situation that I could have from a separated family. Um, my, my father was incredibly involved and in, in, in supportive and all that. But as as one could imagine, two households don't run the same as one. Right. And so it, it was tight. Right. And, you know, probably initially we didn't know that it was tight and, and, and didn't feel that, but we saw things that, that you just knew that it was tight. And, um, with, I guess with that, so your question is how, how did that form me? Um, one thing is that as you look back, you, you think, man, I just want better for my kids. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be good and bad, but you just want something different for your kids. You want them to have the opportunity, um, you know, going back, and this isn't, this isn't a sad story or anything. Um, fifth grade, everybody's getting their, get, getting their instruments to play in band. And 
it just wasn't in the cards that year, right? So that wasn't that rent payment or whatever you had to pay on the trumpet just wasn't in the card. So I didn't get to do that. And that's, that's not a sad story, but that, that was just the reality. Right. right. And you know, you just, you, you think about that and you're like, okay, how can I create something that my kids won't have to experience that? Right. Mm -hmm. Not that those experiences are all bad or all good or, or, or one way or the other, but you just want something different. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, you obviously go on to do great things, but your first start in the professional world, you decide at age 22, the tender age of 22, when a lot of guys are just saying, hey, I want to go to the bar on the weekends, you and a buddy say, let's jump into business for the first time yeah, yeah. and let's uh, let's buy a grocery store, which you had some experience at. Yeah. So walk me through that process when you're 22 and you come up with this huge decision. Yeah. So go and go. It, it probably starts a few years before that. So. Because I was in Wahoo and had all those opportunities to work in a grocery store, right, and get all that experience. When I went to the university, um, like I was like, okay, well, I, I got to have a job, right? There's no, I don't have a trust fund or I didn't have a college fund or anything like that, like most people. And so I had to work, and so it was just a natural evolution to go and work in a work in a grocery store. And so there was a uh, Nash Finch had a had a chain of stores um, at, at that time. And I started working for one of those stores, which we'll probably come back to because what I, I, I probably learned a lot of leadership there. My one of my mentors was there. And so I gained a lot of knowledge on the on on business. Um, so while I'm going to the university and learning things, I'm seeing it in real time. Right. And that was really, really cool. And, and I could find that I could affect P and L's. And so I started, I looked P L's for folks, profit and loss statements, profit, yeah. profit, loss statements, yeah. income statements. I learned that I could, I could really cause change in those. And I was learning more in the business uh, in, in my job than I was at the university. And so I, I found that there's maybe some more natural talent, nat natural skill there. And so as I progress through college, um, you know, I'm becoming an assistant director uh, with, with, with the company. And eventually they said, hey, we're going to give you your own store. And so I uh, got my... What did they see in you at that point, do you think, to do that? It was pretty bold, right? And so I asked for it. And so I just went to, I went, went to the regional directors and I said, hey, you know, I need this. Like, you will do better with me, um, me running the store. And so it was actually me being able to return back to Wahoo to run the store in Wahoo. They had in, in that in that time they had acquired the competition that I worked for in Wahoo. There's two grocery stores at the time, and they acquired the competition. And I said, I'm gonna go run that store for you. And I was just like, I'm stupid, right? And like, I, like I like, but I could just go and say that. And they're like, Yeah, we don't like the guy. We'll we'll we'll, we'll let you run the store. <laughs> I'm sure the conversation was different than that, but that's how I'll remember it. Anyhow, so I, I go and I do that, and um, we're finding some su some success in there, but it was a corporate structure, and there was some challenges inside that corporate structure that just I couldn't see as where I wanted to be for the rest of my life. And so I had met another director in the company, and one day out of the blue, we just we're we're, we're talking right and said we should just go get a store and do it on our own and so you know talk full of bravado you feel you got this right now yeah you know? yeah so yeah. no money right and so like how do we do this and so we just make some phone calls and we find uh we find a store that has a supplier loan on it so they're the wholesaler to the store had lent the money for the for the store owner the store owner had gotten in just kind of gotten backwards on some things and so we went to the supplier and said let's take over the store and um so the store already struggling a little bit I, it's, or... it's 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 doing okay struggling a little bit but um the owner had some personal issues that were, were causing some issues in the town that it was in and uh so we go to the supplier they said hey come back with a hundred thousand dollars and um, we will we will finance the rest for you. You're going to the store, gorgeous store. You know, it was a, I think it was a four million dollar deal that we did at the time. And uh, we go in there, and um, 
so that was my first my first forte in fundraising. It, and it wasn't as difficult as I, I thought it was going to be. We we raised the money in a weekend. So, so, the traditional way, or where, did you have angel investors? Or? Yeah, angel investors. And so we, we went into it, and uh, we operated that store for for about a year, and things were things were okay, right? Um, I had, in working for the Nash Finch Company, I had developed some skill sets of p and management. And so I thought that I really, really good at operations. But I forgot that there's a whole flank behind it where you have to be really good at marketing because you had a team doing the marketing. You had somebody doing risk management, right? You had somebody actually handling the HR benefits. Like you had all those people behind you that you just assumed were just an overhead, but when it becomes your business, well, that's a whole different game. And so instead of just looking forward, we're, we're you know, we're doing all of this and it was just a huge, huge lesson Needless to say, it was Fleming Foods that had backed us. Um, that next year, they went bankrupt. Um, our note that we had with them got called. And so it just, we spent the next six months unwinding the thing. And so usually, like how I like to describe it today when the pain is a little bit further removed is that I got my MBA the equivalent of an MBA, probably the equivalent of a Harvard um, MBA. And uh, that's what it cost me, right? So we had to, you know, obviously pay back the angel investors and all that stuff after after the fact. And so, um, yeah, it was just what a story. It, but but here's, a, I, I want to take this story to a new level. Yeah. Because at this time, uh, in fact, before you buy the story, you decide to get married, right? Mm-hmm. Tell the story, because I love this, about two hours before the wedding, what'd you do and what'd she end up saying? Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So we're getting, you know, we're getting um, married. And so my high school sweetheart that I met at the restaurant, my the dishwasher that I got placed there, bet me a dollar. I went and go get her number. Went and got her number. As I'm telling the story, since she's not here, she was instantly hooked on me, Tim. Oh, I, Could, couldn't get enough of it. Right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I get I had it. hair. I had yeah. hair, you know? And so, um, <laughs> nonetheless, married my high school sweetheart. You know, this is, we're 20, just turning 21 years old. And uh, I get cold feet before the wedding. Not, not because getting cold feet, because... I, I knew this was the person I was going to marry, right? So I go and I say, I got to see, I got to go see Shannon. I got to go see the bride. And I'm like, you can't see the bride for the wedding. I said, I need to go see the bride. And uh, so at least they let me go see Shannon. And I said, hey, I think we've talked about this, but I just need to make sure that we've talked about this. She's like, like, like she thought I had some big secret to reveal, right? <laughs> and uh, I told her, I said, just so you know, in my life, we're going to swing for the fences and we're going to strike out. So I will promise you one thing that we will do well in life, but we will go bankrupt. Are you ready for that ride? And, uh, I don't remember her exact words, but it was essentially, let's do it. Right. Right. So we go and we do the store just a year, year and a half later. Right. And so then we're unwinding this thing and she just looks at me. She goes, well, you told me this was going to happen, but I didn't think it was going to be this quick. You know, that's <laughs> what I love. <laughs> she definitely remember. Oh my gosh. But this is such an important story as well, because the importance of having a partner in your life, right. That is yeah. going to stand by you, uh, through thick and thin. And I've got to imagine that man is, that's one major stressor out of your life, right? Cause it is right by your it side. Is. And I got to tell you, Tim, that, that if you want to test a marriage, um, go through losing everything that you have with two young kids at home and that, that will test a marriage and, and, and a story about that. Right. And so this, nothing, nothing against Shannon whatsoever, because this was the most stressful time of our life. Um, as we're unwinding that, I call the local moving company to get a quote to okay how do we how do we move back to nebraska with the tail between our legs right and um i'll never forget how close i came to him because the mover said it's the same quote i gave your wife three months ago and uh so at that moment you realize that was kind of one of those reset moments of 
wait a minute, I had wanted this so bad. I took my eyes off of this yeah. and, um, you know, it, 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 it was great. And, uh, I don't think we would have traded that experience today with the hindsight and the scars have healed. Um, cause it made us so much closer, but man, that's a tough thing on a marriage with young kids. And so, you know, just, I'm so thankful that she, she stuck by that. Right. right? Cause like w- once, once your partner sticks with you that way, it just, it gives you the confidence to do anything. Right? That, absolutely. And yeah. boy, do you rebound in a significant and massive way not too terribly long uh, long after that. Yeah. However, uh, you know, here you are, and you've walked out of this situation, you've unwound it, you've back in Nebraska. Now take me through the next steps before Arc Financial is born. Yeah, and so obviously you, you, you do what you know and where you can make the most money, right? And so uh, uh, they, they've since been, they've, they've since been sold, but um, back in the day when Harold Cooperman owned No Frills Supermarkets, um, they were getting ready to do a major acquisition. And so they needed talent resources to do that right time, right moment. And um, so I came on the scene and they hired me as a director um, to, to help on operations and, 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 and work through that and, and eventually have my own store. And it was just, that was just like, it was a really, I don't know, I hate using the word safe space, but it was a really good space for us to rebound and and do that. And I worked for No Frills, and uh, I had one condition though. When I went to go work for No Frills, I, I when I when I talked to the leadership team, I said, "I'll do anything but run your Ashland store." Uh, you, you and got, why was that? Um, well, I mean, you know, going back to that small town, I thought, yeah. well, I'm just done with the small town. Yeah, right. I'm gonna, just like, come there, and I'm going to go yeah. run a big city store, and, and and I'll be a director there, and 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 do that. And I, I, and I was doing that right. And I get a I get a call one day and said, hey, we're going to go to lunch, um, from, from from one of the owners. And I said, okay. So we went to lunch. And he said, hey, good news, you're going to go to Ashland. I said, hey, well, don't you remember? I said, I'm never going to run the Ashland store. Um, they gave me the P&Ls, and um, one, of the, one of the gifts that, that, that God has given me, Tim, is I can read a financial, right? And um, I don't know why that's a weird gift I was given, but that was one of the gifts that God gave me. I looked at that financial. I looked at my comp plan, and I said, this is a really good thing for my family. And because um, I knew that there was so much opportunity in this store, and we got – bonus on based upon improvement. Yeah, so it was just like, yeah. So it was just like, okay, there's so much low hanging fruit here that I'm going to be able to provide for my family at, at the next level, mm-hmm. even though it's a much smaller store. And, uh, so I went in, 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 into Ashland, another small town. Um, and I ran that store for, I don't know, three, three, four years. It's funny. Cause that was, that was already 15 years ago, Tim. And people still recognize me as the guy from the grocery store, oh, of right? course. And I and I don't I had hair then, right? And so yeah. I know I keep saying that I had hair then, right? That's how I measure time. <laughs> and and I would spend uh, I'd I'd run into you in aisle three or aisle four, and yeah. we'd have twenty minute conversations. This is when I started learning about Arc Financial too a yeah. little bit. It was kind of in your head, it was germinating, yeah. um, but not quite there yet. Let me ask you this before we get to no frills and and what you saw on that P and L that you believe gave you great opportunity. But when you had that failure and you're now going into corporate America, at any point were you like, this will never happen again. I'm done with with business. I tried. I failed. I'm going to go to the safety and security of corporate. Or were you 100%. determined? So you had no idea to ever go back into being an entrepreneur. Right, right. I thought, okay, I went to the plate, strike out. You know, it. it, it because you get humbled and embarrassed and your pride and your ego and, and all of that stuff has a lot of damage to it in, 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 a, in a failure. Um, but as you come out of that, right? So, and I think men tend to, and I'm stereotyping here, men may tend to do this more than anything is when you have a failure, this spins in your head and you mm-hmm. examine it and you examine it and you examine it. And I did that and it was like, okay, what happened? Like what happened? Like, I would play it over and over again in my life. It just like every night before I go to bed, I play it over and over. And it was like, I didn't know what was going on inside my four walls. And so like four walls of the business, the four walls. Yep. So we call it the four walls of the business. I had no idea what was going on there. I had no way of measuring it. 
And uh, even though I, at, at this point, I have an accounting degree, um, I should know how to measure this, right? And we didn't. Uh, we went out, we hired the best accounting firm in our industry. We still didn't have those tools. I'm not blaming them, but we did not have those tools in place to 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 know what was good, what was bad, what was up, what was down. Give me one thing that would have helped you. When you say we didn't have those tools, what's one thing that would have helped? Yeah, so um, like in our different departments, understanding what the margins were month by month in our different departments, where we needed to put our attention and our focus, right? Um, whether that was, you know, what our gross profit was in those, in those different areas, what our labor, per, our controllable expenses, what our labor expense were in those particular areas. We just didn't have the systems in place to, to know what that was. So we did it all by gut and like, oh yeah, we're doing good or, or, but, but we never knew. And so that was one of those things that I just kind of vowed that, you know, when I was in corporate America, somebody else gave that information to me mm -hmm. and I could look at it and say, I have a problem. Here's how I'm going to fix it. Right. I wasn't, I didn't develop the systems to be able to tell me you have a problem, you need to fix it. It was all by eyesight and we lie to ourselves, right? Like we think everything is good. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're naturally optimistic, right? And so, yeah, that, that's kind of what we, that's what we learned there. Definitely. That's what we learned. So this, you start to ruminate on this a little bit. You're like, boy, in looking back, yeah, you know, it wasn't successful, but if I had known this, if I'd known this. Is this where it starts the the idea of Arc Financial Accounting Firm that is much more than just accounting, right? Yeah. Um, is this where it starts to grow? It is. It is. And um, I had I had a really good friend that helped me with that. And um, in fact, we had the same business start dates. Uh, uh, a buddy started an automotive repair shop, and he comes to me and says, "Hey, Jacob, you crashed and burned. Um, how do I not crash and?" And I was like, dude, like you're being real, real with me right now. Like, like you're humbling me. And so we went in and so this is how Arc Financial was born, right? So we went in and said, Hey dude, in your business, you're going to need to know this and you're going to need to know this and you're going to need to know this. And by the way, you need to know those every day and let's help you build some systems so you can do that. Some, some processes that you can do that. And, and we did. And so like, I'm then all of a sudden I'm feeling like I've got all this energy. I was like, where is all this energy coming from? Because I'm so interested in what is happening here that, um, you know, he comes to me and says, well, gosh, you're doing a lot of work here. Like, how do I pay you? And I was like, I don't know. Just give me a hundred bucks a month. Right. <laughs> like, and I thought, well, that's fine. I'll pay for a week's worth of groceries for the family. And, and, and I'll do this. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, we started doing that. And then the guy across the street, you know, and he starts talking to him and says, well, Jacob, can you do something like that for me? And I was like, yeah, I can, I can do this and we can do this. And you need to know these things. And, um, he goes, well, how much you charge me? And I was like, well, I don't know. I'll charge you 200 bucks a month. Is that good? And he's like, so that's how it started. Um, and, uh, just kind of helping develop those systems and those, and those processes, because, Going back to what I learned was that as an entrepreneur, you're like you're forward focused, right? You're just like, I've got to go do what I'm going to do. What I, what, what I was put on this earth to do, I got to go do it. But again, there's so much behind the scenes that you just have to know what's going on yeah. that if you don't, like, am I running really fast in the wrong direction like I had done? And so we started putting the stuff in place and then these businesses started to achieve a higher level of success. And so it's like, wow, we're on to something. And then we realized that, wait a minute, accounting is for small mid market businesses. It's really two different components because most people think that your CPA has all the answers on how, how we manage our, our payables or how we manage our receivables or, or how we manage cash flow, Like all of these different things that are, are incredibly important in your business. Um, and what we find out is that the most CPAs, spend all their time, their education focused on tax planning and strategy. Mm -hmm. So they're specialists in that. And you need to have that specialist in your life, but it's hard to find a specialist in that that's also really, really great at operational accounting. And so we just decided we're going to focus on the operations. What's going on inside that business's four walls and develop those accounting solutions and processes to make that happen. 
Hey, we're going to take a quick break in the show so that you know about Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland, the sponsor of Leadership Lessons from Mayberry. You know, few banks can say they've been around for 139 years, but Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland has. Why? Because they are locally owned, locally managed, and they are focused on you. They offer full service business banking And you're always going to talk to a live person when you give them a call. They're commercial lenders. They are more than happy to share their expertise and to help you navigate any business financing that you may need, including SBA, TIF, or NEDCO financing. Check them out at fmnb.com or give them a call at 402-944-3316. Member FDIC, an equal housing lender. So... You, you now start to have the foundation of ARC Financial. You're mm-hmm. working at No Frills. But this time, instead of being age 22, you go out, you get a bunch of investors, and you say, cold turkey, we're going. We're going in with both feet into that cold, freezing water. This time, you say, yeah, we might inch into it or maybe right. walk a few blocks into this opportunity. So walk me through the decision to not just jump and leave No Frills, yeah. But to build towards that. Yeah. So um, it was kind of a, I would say that we still jumped a little bit. We, we made a slight jump and um, it was kind of a, it was kind of a weird deal that um, our monthly revenues um, got to the point where I tried to keep expenses as low as possible. We grew our monthly revenue to the point where it would cover our, 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 our house payment. And um, so I just looked at my wife and I said, we good with this? And she goes, yeah, we're good with this. And so we made that jump and, um, and that jump was you leaving or her? I, I, I left. Okay. And so she's still working at the university. Um, and so I had left and we had kind of continued to, to, to grow the business. Um, at that point, you know, probably six months later, we hire our first employee. Um, she was part-time and, uh, it was it was kind of a weird deal, and um, like I, in what way? Why was it weird? Um, just because it wasn't necessarily that traditional em, employer employee relationship. In, in the fact that, like, we were building this, and she knew that she was part of building this, and it was, hey, next week you can work twenty seven hours because that's what we can afford, right? <laughs> um, following week you can work thirty two. Like, so we were, you know, we were just fighting and growing this business. Um, and then we continued to be blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and grow the business over the last 13 years. And yeah. so it's been great. And double digit growth. I know every year yeah. um, you have just, and you have your own space now, you have multiple employees. By the way, that employee that joined you part-time, 27 hours a week, she was limited or whatever it was yeah. for that week. She's still with you. She is. Um, she um, unfortunately uh, has come down with cancer. And so she's backed at this point she's backed out while she's while she's going through that battle but um which is it's heartbreaking right oh, yeah. but yeah. um went and visited her last night and just just an amazing amazing yeah. individual so yeah, all of yeah. the people are great so here's the thing the, the the big question that i have is sustained growth you you started out part-time you take those baby steps and then it just takes off how do you get sustained growth for that business owner out there who's like look i've had two years of growth and i take a step back and then three years and i take a step back what's the key yeah so one of our one of my leadership philosophies is goes back to it's actually stolen from manufacturing it's the theory of constraints and so what we look at constantly in there is as you're looking at your business or as you're looking forward, what is going to break? You know, so like right now in our in our business, our constraint is is people, right? So at, every business owner says that at the at to, in today, right, is is getting is being able to attract great talent, and so with the theory of constraints, what that looks like is when you identify that this is your bottleneck constraint bottleneck interchangeable there when this is your 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 constraint what do we do about it and so how do we allocate resources how do we offload that constraint what are the different things that we can do to grow past that and if we don't have that approach of overcoming those 
how we describe it to our team is we call it overcoming obstacles, right? So um, is if we don't overcome that obstacle, that's where we're limited. And so one thing that um, we try to do a really good job of is explaining to our team what I see as the obstacles today, tomorrow, and next year. So that way, um, and kind of the nice thing about that is I'm not a very smart guy, Tim. They're usually coming up with solutions before I even need them. Right. And so, um, that's, that's so you, you throw that obstacle out. Hey, a year from now here, here is the constraint that we could be dealing with. Right. And then your team starts to, you and your team start to work on it or, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of times it's our team that comes back with the idea of, Hey, you know what? We see, we see a constraint six months from now is we're going to to be really good at training new hires. We're going to have to be, we're going to master class at that. And our team came back and said, what if we do this? with as we're bringing on more and more staff what what if we do this because in the olden days you know when you go from two to four you just set that fourth person in there and have them watch the other three right and they'll pick up on it but you know when you're going you know 12 to 13 15 to 16 like that's not necessarily you can't just have them watch everybody we have to put some more systems and processes in place and so we really really focus on trying to identify what's going to break so for the business owner out there, do you sacrifice growth if you can't find the folks that fit into your culture or do you say, we're going to overcome it some other way, but we're not going to sacrifice growth? So my weakness, Tim, <laughs> is so many times, um, again, entrepreneurs have an optimistic perspective, right? right. I'll, I'll figure that out. So many times had I listened to somebody else saying, hey, let's pump the brakes a little bit, and I don't, it's caused us some heartburn, right? And so um, I think that there are times, um, you know, I don't think that businesses should ever grow necessarily linear, right? Because sometimes you'll grow and then you'll need to let everything catch up to that and then get ready for the next stage of growth. And I think if you look over a period of, of decades that you'll, you'll actually be a lot further than trying to continuously now be aggressive, but trying to figure out where you're at. And if we need to pause, let the forces come up, advance, let the forces come up is probably a, a, a strategy that we've seen be more successful in the long term. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Well, what you are doing is so successful and you just get busier and busier and busier. So in a nutshell, if you were to say to someone, here's what we do and here's what we do for businesses, and I know you've kind of explained in the past, but if you were to condense it, what what would you say to that business owner who's thinking, I'm just looking for an accounting firm, but you guys are much more than that. So what would you say to them? So in in all reality, um, so when you think of an accountant, you think of somebody that's going to do your income taxes. Uh, we prepared exactly zero income taxes last year in our entire firm, right? So we focus on the other piece of your business as we talked about that operational account. Yeah. So if a business owner is, is, is running up against things in their business from an accounting perspective or an operation perspective that either due to competency, their own internal competency, they've grown faster than they are, are able to do are able to keep up with if it's an issue of confidentiality um, or just an issue of, I want to look forward and I want somebody to, to be able to help me identify if we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And so what we do for those businesses is help them, help them set up and develop their accounting systems and their processes. And today, um, most businesses have multiple different pieces of software that's touching their business in a financial way. How do we make sure that those are all talking to each other, that we're getting the data we need in the right people's hands in order to, to run that business? And through that, a lot of times, either due to competency or confidentiality, um, some of those processes, the business owner is like, we don't want to do that. And so our team will manage that process for So whether that's, um, you know, it it could be as complex as developing um, for an e-retailer, developing a a complex open to buy model for them so they know how to replenish inventory, what their budgets are, to as simple or to 
helping a business run their payroll and manage their manage their um, retirement piece of that to helping a business reconcile their books and pay their bills. Anything kind of in between there is where we'll step in and we'll help that business owner. But most importantly, most business owners are really, really good at their craft and their trade. And uh, we see this with doctors, right? So a doctor is the smartest person in the room. And we work with a lot of medical, with a lot of medical um, clinics and, and practices and doctors is you're the smartest person in the room, but that doesn't mean that you're an expert in small business finance, right? Mm-hmm. And so walking alongside of them and helping them understand that, hey, you don't need to know every little detail of how we're going to amortize this or, or do that. But you know what? If you watch these three or four different metrics in your business and you're able to identify them and track them, it's going to be hard for you to lose. Like, and that, that's what that I think that's what that secret sauce is. I love it. And that's what you wanted when you were 22 years old, yes. right? You yeah. wanted that secret sauce that would have helped you with that first, uh, first, you know, acquisition and entrepreneurial venture for you. Yeah. And that's where it all emanates from, doesn't it? It does. Right? It yeah. does. You know, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times failure causes, causes success, you know, by, by picking that up. Right. So, um, I mean, you see that in sports teams that go undefeated and then they lose the last game. Right. Yeah. And cause they didn't face any adversity throughout the year. And so, you know, maybe, maybe not a great analogy, but yeah, that's kind of how, that's kind of how we look at that is adversity helps you. Right. Absolutely. You can yeah. learn so much, especially when you stay open-minded like you did. All right, let's do a couple of leadership lessons here as we get towards the end. But one of the things that you told me is you've always been very good. Like you live life, you travel, you go out, but you also have been very good at making sure that when you, you take your profits and invest back into the business, talk about that leadership lesson that, that uh, you can share with people. Right. Right. And so businesses go through different lives, through different life cycles. Right. And so in order to grow a business, it's just going to, it's going to require you to retain some of those earnings, you know, we call it retained earnings, retain some of those earnings, invest it back into the business. Um, those investments don't always work well, right? But, um, you know, in the early days, we would have, you know, everybody would always ask you like, hey, where are you at in the market? What are you, what are you doing? I was like, dude, I'm not in the market because I can get a higher return putting that money back into myself than I could ever buy an IBM stock, right? And so um, that's, that's really, really important. And to kind of go off of where you started with is, um, I'm, I'm going to steal this cause I, I had, I had heard, um, this described to me just last week is since you're a sports guy, we're going to stick with the sports analogies <laughs> is that, you know, when I was growing up, we used to have to do the presidential run, right? Every year you had to run a mile. I don't know if, if that was, better. oh yeah. And so that's four times around the track. Right. And so this guy, this guy described it to me, um, and said, life is four times around the track. Each lap is 20 years. What lap are you on? And, um, that kind of puts things in perspective because so often in our lives, we are focused on that fourth and final lap. Right. So, and we have to be right. Like you're going to save, you're going to invest, you're going to do all those different things, but we should probably maybe even put a little more focus on that second and third lap. Right. In terms of making sure that we're living life, we're enjoying that run and, and going through there. Um, a lo- local business owner uh, in in Ashland, where where we're at, uh, in the early days, he would go on a walk around town after he closed his business. He'd walk around town every night, and if my light was on, he would pop open that door, and uh, he would say to me, "Jacob, you realize you got two kids and a wife at home." At that time, we had two kids. Um, you realize that you got two kids and a wife at home, right? He's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just got to finish this up." And finally, one day, he 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 opens that door and he says, "Jacob." I've made all the money that I could ever use in my life, right? My wife left me and some of my kids don't talk to me. Why don't you just go home and take care of that? And that just hits you like a ton of bricks, right? Like, wait a minute, what am I doing here? And so, um, you know, to, to, to steal a, a phrase from, uh, from a book I read once is that you just got to enjoy the ride while you're doing it because man, there's, it goes by so fast, doesn't it? It does. It yeah. does. And that's an absolutely great lesson. So often business owners, you know, it, we're all competitive, right? And uh, that's part of why business owners are with, in the business, right? Because yeah. they're competitive. But wow, uh, you can't forget that. I think right. Stephen Covey said something once that 
don't don't spend all your time you know working and then something at the end of your life you can't enjoy it right right you know, don't forget it, basically the walk along the way which yeah. is all right let's talk about pricing because you said there was a point in your life you were not good at pricing no um so i don't know if i still i don't know if i am <laughs> yet right so you know here's a and i know this is going to be so broad jacob but what would be the advice for any business owner when they're sitting down saying how do I go about pricing? Is there any general advice that you could give them? Yeah. So, and this, this advice actually comes from my, from my father-in-law a little bit, because when we went and bought the grocery store, I'll, I'll, I'll build upon this. When we went and bought the grocery store, he said, he just comes to me and says, why? What? Like, why are you doing this? You know, you're competing with everybody over, you're, you're fighting over pennies, right? Your margins are going to be razor thin. Why is that the business that you pick, right? And so some people are just, that's their passion. That's what they're going to do. And they're going to have, their their price is going to be dictated by the market, right? Um, there's going to be some people that um, what you're able to do is add so much value to people's lives that the price becomes less and less of an issue. I mean, if you think about Walmart, Hy-Vee, right? Th their pricing is not the same, but Hy-Vee adds so much value if we're going to stick with the grocery stores. And so what we learned is that you have to be able to add a bunch of value to people and then the price just doesn't become as big a part of the equation. So even if you're doing a commodity type business, you can do it where you are doing it in a different way than anybody else. And that's why I love entrepreneurship, Tim, is because if I can figure out a way to take what God has given me as a skill, go out into the marketplace and change people's lives. The rest is just going to kind of take care of itself. Now, that being said, that's been a long battle in terms of understanding where we have to price our products and services. Like I, like we talked about before, um, we, we, we started, we started out, pay me a hundred bucks a month. Right. And now we would just laugh at that. Right. Because it's like, you're providing so much more value than that to that business owner. So, you know, it, that evolves with it, right? Do you have to quantify in your business? I mean, do you have to say, you're paying me this, but this is what you're going to get back? Or do you just provide that service So, and that will take care yeah, of it? Yeah. So, so we've never made promises of here, here's your return. Mm -hmm. But what we do, unlike a lot of, uh, a lot of maybe our peers or other competitors, is when we're going through the sales process, we explain to them that um, you're not in a contract. I mean, we have a contract, but read this clause right here. You, you're not happy, we're done. And so we just usually say that you'll know it. Um, if, if you're not feeling it, that's great. You can, you're not going to be bound to us. I'm not going to bind you if I'm not providing value to you. And so um, I'm really glad that we, we took that from from the very get-go and um our hope is just always that everybody looks at it and says man i'm getting value there yeah 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 i love it well you know uh obviously i have washburn business coaching so yeah. help companies grow their business i always ask everyone who comes on tell me about the most influential coach or uh, business mentor that you've had and why they were and what yeah. they gave you yeah. So I, and this one's, this one's easy for me, right? So it's, uh, it's Bill Wagner. And so Bill Wagner, um, back in college when I was working, um, when I was working with the Nash Finch company, um, Bill was a, just a unique character, right? And so you loved or hated Bill. And it seems like the people that were around for a long time loved the guy, right? Um, and he was probably the hardest person I ever worked with. And, but the thing about it is, is that he taught me um, not only to push yourself, how to push your people, um, how to build a team, but in all reality, he taught me my craft because, you know, he, he would he would always make a comment about, well, you know, you're going you're getting your accounting degree or whatever. You should know this stuff. But he's the one that taught me how to read a PML and make it come alive or profit loss report. In that, in all reality, anybody can do this because you only need to really be able to control and track two or three different things on that profit and loss. And he would just emphasize that, emphasize that, and emphasize that. And, you know, going back, Bill Wagner had no formal education in that. 
he grew up in it. He learned it. I'm sure somebody taught it to him, but just that art of being able to look at a piece of paper and see how those numbers are affected by what we're doing inside of our four walls and what we can do to change those numbers. And then once those numbers behave, the profit takes care of itself. And so, um, you know, it, and he's also the one that taught me that profit is a really, really good thing. And that's sometimes a shallow thing. Um, or people w- w- would say that, Jacob, that's shallow. You're just all about profit. No, 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 no. I'm not all about profit. I'm all about what profit can do, right? Because if I'm going to go work for a company, I want to make sure that that company is profitable right? So I'm not worried about my paycheck on Friday. I can get the additional benefits. I know that we're going to reinvest back into that business. And, you know, profit is what changes. We're, we're, this all circles back to Mayberry, right? Mm-hmm. So we're both from Ashland. And if you look back at Ashland, how that community has grown over the, the last 20 years, um, a lot of that has been funded or been, there's been a catalyst behind that of successful businesses in our community. Mm-hmm. And so if all those businesses were not profitable, I don't believe our community as a whole would have a state of the art library, um, as we're moving into a state of art, a state of the art performance center, yeah. right? Um, schools. performing arts center, yep. the schools, all that stuff happens because, Somebody along the line understood, and I'm not saying this is the only thing, Tim, but it certainly helps a community grow when there are businesses that are thriving inside that community. Yeah, that is exceptionally well said. And uh, we need to get you up in front of a crowd and say that again. So (laughs) (laughs) I'll tell you what, Jacob Beloshek, congratulations on your success. Um, This has been great, fascinating, and there's a lot that we can all learn from this. So thanks for coming on. Hey, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Tim.